What would happen if you could stop worrying so much about what your team was doing all day and instead focus in on what you're supposed to be doing to move your business forward? Sounds like a dream, but right now you're living the nightmare of having to overcoach, overhandhold, and overcheck in on your team's work. Let's put an end to that and instead roll out super clear 5R work plans, drum beats, and more of my signature tools that drive accountability and self-sufficiency deep into your team. All you have to do is join a Leadership Lab program, and I'll help you turn your team troubles into triumphs. You'll be learning and growing alongside some peers that will become valuable business friends. So why not go beyond this podcast and join us? It could be the smartest thing you do this year. Book a call with me and see what program would best fit you over at the website, stackingyourteam.com slash programs. Welcome to Stacking Your Team, a show for entrepreneurs who are ready to step into the CEO role of their business by attracting and retaining key talent. Hey there, I'm Natalie Ekdahl, host of the Biz Chicks podcast. Our clients and community are rapidly expanding their businesses and need support as they stack their teams. Your incredible host, Shelly Warren, leverages her background growing and leading teams in multiple organizations, including a Fortune 50 corporation. So are you ready to stack your team? Here's Shelly. Hello, hello, and welcome back to the Stacking Your Team podcast, where during this series, I'm featuring business owners who are leading teams. Come and join me as we chat with Antonia Boivison Brown, who's a former American Express leader from the UK who now is living in France. She's the owner and the managing director of Kidu Land, a children's activity center that has continued to grow over the years in client base programming, team structure, and now actual space. Antonia and her team have built a strong reputation for serving young clients and families teaching English by offering unique and, yes, award-winning programming for their community. Can you imagine the challenges of serving young people who, as you know, get bored easily? And of course, Then there's the safety regulations and the trust expectations and concerns from the parents. And then, oh yeah, let's add on the stress of expanding and renovating brand new space. I can't wait for you to meet Antonia and hear how she's moved from her first hire to promoting from within to now creating a full-blown leadership team. And spoiler alert, if you ever thought about moving to or visiting the French Riviera, wait until you hear about her podcast. And stay tuned to the end of our interview for the new segment, Ask Me Anything, where I open up the floor for my guests to ask me for some help as they work through a current team or leadership situation. Antonia asks for help on how to improve communications within her team. I share with her some thoughts on document storage, team communication, and the beauty of transparency when you have a team calendar. So are you ready to stack your team? Then come join me. Let's meet Antonia. Welcome to the podcast, Antonia. Thank you for having me, Shelley. Nice to see you again. It's so fun for me to be in Canada and you to be in France and <laughs> to be able to connect. Totally global. Taking Biz Chicks global, huh? Very global. And you know my love of all things luxury and the fact that there's a chandelier hanging from your dining room ceiling behind you. <laughs> it, oh, it just warms my heart. And I've been to France a few times, but always with my corporate career. And I was lucky enough for each of those trips to be able to stay over for the weekend so that I could plan 
some exciting things to do, like stay in Paris for the weekend and check out the Louvre and try and hit as many cafes as I could. Oh my gosh, such a wonderful time to be there. So um, I definitely want to make sure that I get to go back again. And then, of course, meeting you at BizChicks Live last year, who, to be honest with you, what attracted me to you was your English accent, because <laughs> that's the other big place in my heart is for anything UK. And so then to find out that you are a UK businesswoman living in France, and you have been for many years, and your entire business blends both of those worlds together, that just gives me goosebumps. So tell, tell us, what are you most excited about in your business right now? Wow, it has been quite a year since I last physically saw you at Biz Chicks Live, where I was really lucky to have some one-on-one -on -one time with you. Literally, I came back motivated, hit the ground running when I got back here, and just put so many of the things that I'd learned through you guys into practice. And I had my little pebble that Natalie had given us yes. at Biz Chicks Live, and my word was grow. And it literally sat in the corner of my desk. And every time I had a mental wobble, um, a bit of a mindset, it was there looking right back at me. And I even had a bracelet made saying believe because I just needed to believe that I could grow. And that's basically what we've done since then is we took, we already had one premises, which was um, 1,600 square feet. And so we've taken on a second one now, which is slightly bigger, 1,800 square feet. So it's 3,400 altogether of space, and it was a total wreck of a place. So I had to totally gut it and design the, how we needed the new space to be. It was brilliant fun. It was totally <laughs> different from the day job. I, I saw some I of your posts. <laughs> I watched some of your posts on Facebook, some of your Facebook Lives. I think it was the one I remember the most um, vividly. I think it was the day you actually got the key to the space. <laughs> you, were, you were giving a tour to everyone and you were excited and enthusiastic and optimistic about what you were going to be able to do with this amazing new space. And I think just below the camera level, legs shaking with the, oh my goodness, what have <laughs> I done? But yeah, it was, it, it's a huge project. A foreign woman in a, in a French country, which can be quite a masculine environment working mm -hmm. on a renovation which is also quite a masculine environment mm -hmm. um, blonde so you know you've got it all stacked up in the cards where they sort of think yeah I'm gonna get loads of money out of this woman and you know not do a good job so yeah. there was all that but it was just, it was great to have a whole new focus on my project and I could only do it because in the last two years as, as I've been listening to Biz Chicks podcast I've been putting things into place to allow me to have the free time to work on a, a really intense renovation project, which I had to turn around in like six to eight weeks. But it wasn't like we had four months to do it. I wanted to be up and running for the summer. So it, that's what's happened since I last saw you. <laughs> wow, I'm so impressed. And so this new space, is it near to the existing space? Yes, yes, it is. The, originally, the plan had been to open one about 20 minutes or maybe 30 minute drive away. Mm -hmm. However, I had, uh, I believe in the power of um, positivity and putting it out to the universe. And about two years ago, I was in my old space and I just remember saying to myself, I really want that space that's there because it ticks boxes of things that I needed. I wanted to have, I needed to have a new access for disabled access, those kind of things. So I really wanted that space and suddenly it became available. I was just like, I've got to take it. I, I can't put that off because someone else will take it. And so it was literally the opportunity is there. It's like, are you going to take it and seize the opportunity and do it or pass it up? And with that pebble in the corner of my desk, I was like, we're going to grow. We're going to do it here. Learn how to scale close by, close proximity. It still has the same challenges as if it was 40 minutes away. Yeah. But not that whole, I'm not running up and down a, a freeway, a motorway, like getting between the two. It's a lot closer in proximity. So the, the fact that you're not feeling compelled to be in your, current, in your current space and then wanting to set up a new space and all of the stress that would be associated with that, the commute, the drive, the just juggling things back and forth, carrying supplies and equipment that you would need, that's a real stress reducer for you. 
yeah, it's been a great kind of beta test, if you like. So we've, we've doubled the space, more than doubled the space. We've had to increase the team. Um, there's lots of strategic things, process and procedures that we've had to put in place. So we're doing that now and we're building our sort of holy grail of how to run Kiddoland. Yeah. And then it just means that when we do the next one and then the next one, it's all documented and I can even renovate now. So, you know, building up all the skills to be able to go in and do it in other places. Wow. What a confidence booster. So tell, tell us, bring us back to when you first had this idea that you wanted to create an English language activity center. So we had basically, um, I, I've been living in the UK and I used to work, just to give you a bit of background, I used to work in American Express mm-hmm. and work my way up to be project manager, operationals leader. And like any of those big companies, they throw training at you all the time. It was fantastic. So leadership, project management, uh, change management, how to give and receive feedback, you know, all those kind of corporate courses that you sort of learn. And I was there about seven years, but, and it was brilliant. I, I really loved my time there. That really is a, a great foundation for what I've set up now. And I didn't realize that at the time, but how much I draw on those trainings, Myers-Briggs, all those kind of things were all done in the corporate world. Then I had children and I didn't really want to be working in that sort of kind of job where I had to travel a lot. And so I pulled my hours back and on the side set up an au pair agency with my sister. I was in England. She was in France. I looked after the au pairs and the families once they came over and she found them from France. So that gave us experience again in like HR. And because it's a really intense relationship when you've got a nanny or an au pair in your house. Mm-hmm. So dealing with all that sort of um you know, all those problems that you get, the conflict between people. So then roll forward, we've moved to France. I I stopped working in the au pair agency. I let my sister deal with that. And then I just am quite entrepreneurial. I get bored and I really like working for myself and not having a boss. So (laughs) I um, researched for about 18 months what was out there. I came from England, which like the States, like Canada, had tons and tons of activities for kids. And there really wasn't the same. This is going back now to 2006, 2005, when I started the research. There really wasn't that amount of stuff going on for kids. And I didn't want to pay someone else to teach my kids English. So I thought, well, rather than pay someone else, I'll do it myself. Mm -hmm. And so that's what we did. We uh, researched the market, chose the location, brilliant location right near the sort of hub of um, IT down here in the south of France. And also, you know, a table and a couple of chairs, took on the rent of the premises, opened the door and crossed our fingers. I know that we'd done loads of research, but it was a bit, you know, it sort of feels a bit like that when you start out. You hope people are going to buy into your idea. And they did. We didn't need it to be glitzy. We didn't need it to be glamorous. They really wanted the team to be the most important thing. Who are they putting in with their kids? Just, you know, are they going to look after them? Are they, you know, clean, friendly, happy? And is my child going to learn? You know, I'm going to pay all this money. Are they going to get, you know, good English education from it? And that's really how it sort of started. And I was doing everything. I was in there teaching. I'd be sometimes cleaning the toilets. I learned how to design a website on Dreamweaver, taught myself Dreamweaver, because we didn't have the money to outsource, you know, and I didn't want to take out huge bank loans. Thank goodness, because then 2008 came and the recession came. Mm-hmm. And because we kept a really tight ship and I hadn't taken out any loans, it just made you just had to tighten things even more. And um, instead of buying like really expensive supplies of stationery, we would like recycle. So we were doing yeah. that way back before. But that was really from a financial perspective. But mm-hmm. it's also now an environmental thing. And so you learn to sort of make sure you've got a really tight ship. You're really thinking before you spend any money. And then as you start to grow, you can sort of ease the the purse strings a little bit. And gradually then, of course, on hiring teachers. That was the main thing to start with, was hiring teachers. And so it was a very flat level company. There was me, and then there was just this line, a horizontal line of teachers. Everyone was the same. And I had a very open door policy. I might as well have not had a door. It just was like, yeah, whenever you have a problem, no worries, I'm here and we'll talk. Mm -hmm. And that's kind of how we built the company soul, if you like. And that worked really well when it was in its sort of startup phase. But as it gradually got bigger and bigger, 
and busier and busier, those constant interruptions meant that I would get thrown off track. Mm -hmm. And so the main thing that you, particularly with, in our one-to-one -one at Biz Chicks Live and Natalie on some of her podcasts taught me was I had to hire even more people. And I was so reluctant to do that. Yeah, it's scary. Because it's yeah. so scary. And also, if you can do the things, like I can do my website. I can do my um, newsletters. I, I'm quite multitasking. So it didn't seem any point to kind of give that away and pay someone else to do it. And that was a huge mindset change for me to go, actually, if you free up your time, you can then do even more strategic things and then grow. So that's kind of where it got to. And then, so we've actually put in another level now. So there's me, and then there's about three people that are kind of the leadership team. And mm -hmm. they're the buffer. Um, and they've taken on loads of my day-to-day -day tasks. So number one, it frees me up hugely. Mm -hmm. But number two is it's allowed me to grow them, their roles and responsibilities. And, you know, where they might have always thought, I'm only ever going to teach. Suddenly, oh, well, now I'm going to be leading the team or planning this, um, this program or... Uh, yeah, signing up for this quality label that we want to get accredited for, whatever. I remember at Bistrix Live, you came and you talked to me about this sense of overwhelm that you had because you were this multi-talented person that had this amazing business idea. You knew the marketplace were, were dying for it. You knew you could totally make it happen. And so you were doing it. You had a very successful business. In all intents and purposes, you, you were on fire with this whole kiddo land. And I was intrigued with the whole concept of it because I'd never really heard of a single solopreneur deciding to start that kind of a business. I definitely am familiar with corporate brands that have those types of activity centers. But yours was, had that homegrown feel, but high quality, high touch, and a high level of safety and care for all of your kids that were coming in really cool. And I remember you telling me that you were just, just worn out essentially. And you were so happy to be over in California at Biz Chicks Live to have a break from it all, right? No one was tugging on your skirt, asking you for any questions, writing that you needed. And I remember talking to you about, let's look at what the first priority team member that you need to bring on. And we talked even about accounting right? And how we needed to get that off your plate. <laughs> well, we haven't quite got that far yet. So yeah. <laughs> it's, that's okay. it's on yeah. the to-do list. Um, to -do list. That's complicated because there's a whole mm -hmm. amount of give up. You know, I'd have to give up every single of one of my passwords to allow a bookkeeper to go in and print off every single invoice. Because over here, I have to account for even my one euro expenditures. I have to produce a, an invoice. And I'm not ready to let them into my Facebook accounts and my, you know, so my husband does it for now. And that kind of works at the moment, as long as we do it early enough and we're not leaving it to the last minute. That's mm. what we've had to figure out. Yeah. And there's ways that you can just, out as the business grows, to bring in some more um, sophisticated systems into your business that will allow you to have a team member go in and look at all these things and do their work without you feeling like it's so intrusive. To Absolutely. Your yeah. And it, yeah, so that is kind of on the list. I signed up for QuickBooks. So that's the first thing. Mm -hmm. And so we are moving along there. But what, one thing you did help me with was the online business manager. You helped me craft the advert for that. And the person I got is perfect for the role and literally that spoke out to her because we wrote it in such a different way. Mm -hmm. And it was that kind of, you know, we're looking for the superstar, you can do this from the beach. And it just was totally what she wanted working around her kids. And she's brilliant and she's so organized in a way that although I'm organized, I just don't seem to be able to be as organized as I want to be because I get interrupted all the time. Whereas, <laughs> you know, she's one of those implementers and integrators. That's her, you know, totally brilliant at that. So. So yeah, so we took her on and then we, we created the leadership team. Mm -hmm. So that's added in that level. But we had to do it in a really friendly way because to suddenly promote people up from one level, it, it, it's a promotion, but as well, I want the whole team to understand everyone from the cleaner right up to the top person is equally as important in the team. 
and that if anyone's not there, not showing up um, to do the work, then it affects everyone. And so no one's more important than anyone else. And that I truly believe that. And actually, Kayla Land only works because of the team. And mm-hmm. I think it's Richard Branson that sort of says something along the lines of focus on your team. That's the most important. And employee, uh, the clients come second. And it's so true, particularly in my service industry, where we're trying to give the kids an amazing experience. So they're learning English through Lego, cooking, art, all those kind of activities. But we do it in English. And giving them loads of fun. But I want the team to have fun. If they're feeling stressed and then they get cranky, they're going to react in the classroom and the kids will say, I don't want to come back. Yes. And they're all going to lose. So it's really important. Very vocal to their moms (laughs) and dads about what it is they want to do. So the fact that you promoted from within, that, I mean, there's a whole different nuance as the CEO of a business, when you want to shift over and start promoting from within that you need to be cognizant of. And it's, it's that whole premise of not wanting to actually add or disrupt to the dynamics of the culture that you so beautifully built as the foundation exactly. around Kiddo land, because there's personalities at play here, right? So when someone's being chosen to be promoted from the team, whereas today I'm your team member, tomorrow I'm your leader, there's a different, there's a shift in responsibility and there's definitely a shift in expectations. And in order to not disrupt the, the beauty of what you've already built in, I'm sure you had to have taken a lot of care into who you chose and then how you communicated this to the extended team. So tell me more about what was your selection process like? Well, some of it was sort of naturally chosen for me in that I knew some people wouldn't, it wasn't the right moment for them to take on extra roles and responsibilities. So that would eliminate them straight away. Um, and then I had to really look at who would complement my skill set. So I'd, I've done the Colby, mm-hmm. uh, I, the Myers-Briggs and those kind of things. So I, and I will be someone that's quite, um, I'll, I'm very ideas. So I'll be like, okay, I've got an idea. Let's go with it. And you know, my relationship at home, I'm the wow. And my husband is the how, and yeah. you know, but the next day I'll, I'll change. And I might go, I might've eliminated that idea because I'll have filtered it through in my head and then gone, no, actually that's not going to work. Yeah. My, so my standard answer is I, I'm just talking out loud. Yeah. <laughs> I said to her, Mark, can you give me 24 hours before you give me feedback on my idea? Because it might not be an idea anymore. That's brilliant. I love that because your idea may change or just pivot a little bit. Yeah. And I just consider it to be brainstorming and in brainstorming, every idea is okay. <laughs> it's when you get through to the elimination process that you, so I needed someone that also wasn't going to be, um, so to work as my assistant, the, the person that's going to deal with all the clients, that role needs to be someone that could, take direction from me, but also understand that I might pivot and not be frustrated. Some people really can't work in that framework and I totally respect that. And that would be the person that I would give the job to once it's been decided. And mm-hmm. I'd say, right, now we've got it. Here you go, implement it and, yeah. and run with it. So that mm-hmm. couldn't be the person that's working right beside me because I think they just would be very frustrated with my way of working. Yeah. So that sort of helps you to sort of figure out who's going to fit in that and really I just had to be open and honest with everyone working with me and just say look it's a team effort this is how we're going to do it uh these two people are going to take on these roles so you're instead of coming to me can you go to them and just they're just great people I work I'm really lucky to work with great people we've chosen well whenever we hire we choose as a team so you know you have your standard hiring process and anyone that's going to work with the team has to then spend time with the team working alongside the team in a sort of shadow experience, shadowing experience. And then the team will come back to me and say whether they think that's going to be a good fit for the team or not. And if they said no, I wouldn't hire. So it's, it's always a team decision Mm -hmm. because it's so important to me that I don't add into what is a great team, a problem. And they're the ones on the ground working and they know best, they know, you know, it, you know, it might be that they're really into horoscopes and they want to be able to talk, you know, whatever it is mm-hmm. that makes that team work well together in what's a pressure environment. Cause kids are quite discerning. They're quite challenging. They're very energetic. You know, we, we, we have to be on our, on our top game. And so we have to, yeah, be able to rely on your other team members. You don't want people calling in sick. 
for mm. no reason. You want people turning up on time so that you're not having to cover two classes because someone's late. Or Yeah, having your your hiring decisions based on a team decision really elevates your extended team's sense of obligation to want to see this new team member onboarded really well. And they, they really have a sense of ownership for them to be successful. So instead of this new person being a lay on to them, they were actually a part of the process. So very much, that was a really great idea for you. So how are you thinking now that you've got this bigger space so you can expand your programs, you can expand the number of kids that are coming in how are you thinking about making sure that because of the complexity of the growth of the business, that you're not drifting off your standards? Yeah, that's really where my focus is right now is process and procedures. So documenting what's in my head and basically saying to everyone now, what is your role? Document your role. What, even the cleaner. What, what's your process for cleaning this much bigger space now? Um, how, when even so, what, so one of my other team members is working on how, when we onboard a new team mem- member what's the process we go through what do they the health and safety manual we have to go and show them the fire extinguishers we have you know every step, step that we do I don't want to leave it to chance now because we don't want to spread ourselves so thin and the quality drops so we want to be sure that everyone gets the same experience from a client from a new team member etc Yeah, it's really, really critical when you get big to make sure that your standards and all of your job aids and your your, um, standards of operations are all still in line with what your initial mission and vision was. Because now you have this bigger team that's essentially an extension of you and your brand. So you want to make sure that every new kid that's coming in, every parent, they're 100% delighted with everything that's happening. And I've seen it happen where when it's a small, intimate team, it's just this really well-oiled machine. And then the minute you start adding on other layers of team and another layer of team, things can really get watered down. And people are so busy, they're playing in their own lane, like they're doing their own roles, responsibilities. They don't even often notice that there's been a drift until it's a real hardship. And then the work comes in trying to redo everything and just, you know, doing all the rework to bring it back to base. Yeah, I can see that. I really can see that. And so I think right now where I'm spending more time is actually in meetings with team members now. So Mm -hmm. I wouldn't necessarily have had to have those before. And I'm not a huge, you know, Amex used to have tons of meetings that you didn't really ever need. You'd go to a status report every week and you'd be like, oh, so boring. Why are we here? Yes, is it over yet? (laughs) So I don't want to create that kind of environment. We huddle quite a lot. So we do standing up. I'll check in with the teacher. How's it going? How do you think this morning's session? Any problems? I've also trained my team over the last three years, I would say, not to come to me with a problem. They can come to me with a problem and some solutions. Mm -hmm. So I don't want them to come to me expecting me to solve the problem. I want them to come and we're going to talk about which of their solutions. And I might have a different one. But I, so now everyone comes with ways to fix any issues that they find, which is, as a leader, just so refreshing. And it's so powerful for the organization because everyone's looking to tighten things up and improve things. It's brilliant. Yeah, everybody wants to come to work and really thrive, right? No one wants to come to work and just survive the shift. You know, people want to come in and have it be feel such a flowy day that before you know it, it's the end of the day. And they think, Oh my gosh, where'd the day go? That's the kind of environment that you want to have. So now that you're, you know, you've really stepped into this role of a CEO, Antonia, and really nurturing your, your team that you've built. I'm just thrilled. That gives me goosebumps when I see small business owners, especially someone like you who started out as a solopreneur with an idea who's now built this empire, you're, you're adding to the economy in your area. You're yeah. offering job opportunities to people. You're impacting people's lifestyle, not just for the parents of the kids, but for your actual team members. You're doing something so big for your community. And the fact that you recognize that now you need to spend time nurturing these people and really hosting these team meetings. What are some of the 
topics and what are some of the things you get into when you're hosting these team meetings? Uh, today was um, looking at customer care, so making sure that as we've expanded, we're not going to drop the quality because there's more clients. And so making sure that we've got our checklist. We, we onboard our new clients in the same way we might a team member, so they'll be watched for a month while they're with us. And we check in back with the parents, give them feedback on how their child's doing in the program. And in that time, if there's any problems, we'll try and iron them out with the teachers because, you know, our end aim is to sign that person up for, you know, several years. So we want it to work. So that was we're having a little, a little brainstorming between us on how to better improve that process to make sure that no one gets, no balls get dropped. We don't forget to sort of shine a light on any one child. So that and was I'm, one I'm today. thinking you must get a lot of, uh, like, multiples from families, like, multiple children in the family and then their cousins and their second cousins and their neighbors. Yeah. I'm picturing a lot of word of mouth referrals. It's huge. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It's huge. And credit to the team. I get phone calls now where people say my friend outside school has said, you're the the best. You're the one we need to go to. And you just have that moment of like, wow, you know, that is it. Cause you're just doing your daily job. But then when you sort of, people you don't even know are talking about you outside school, that's kind of cool. It's very cool. (laughs) Very cool. And do you have to do a sort of like a criminal background check on every new member that joins your team? Yeah. Is that an easy process where you are? Yeah, it is. Basically, I have always treated hiring, um, because of the the industry I'm in, I'm going to put my own kids with you. I want to be sure that Mm -hmm. you are top-notch. So have you got the diplomas? Have you got the experience? Let me see your CV. Are there any blanks in your CV? Are there too many changes in your CV? So are you changing every year um, Mm -hmm. jobs? That would be a flag to me because it means that someone hasn't wanted to keep you or you haven't wanted to stay. Uh, And then the criminal reference check. So that's really very easy and it's free in this country. Uh, I want to see the original of your ID to be sure it's not being photoshopped. Mm-hmm. Because that's the, the risk these days is if it's all digital that uh, people can change stuff. Yeah. Uh, and I also want references that I will phone up and actually phone up and I want to speak to that person. Mm-hmm. Because an email check or a, or a written check for me, it just doesn't... I think people are always scared to put anything into writing yep. that they might say in a mm-hmm. conversation or they might not say. So it's sometimes the things they don't say that will make you go, mm-hmm, that's a bit of a red flag. And, and I'd rather hire slow, like they say, hire, hire slow and fire fast. I've never actually fired anyone. I think we've come to arrangements to not renew contracts and things like that. You know, sometimes it just gets to its natural end. Yeah, sure. But, uh, Necessary endings. And it sounds like you're doing all the right things to eliminate risk. Your, yeah. your entire reputation is, is built on you, your husband, your property, and your team. And the ability to be able to host these children that are coming in under your care and guidance for the day, for the camp, for the entire year. And then they're coming back and forth. So the fact that you're putting so much care into making sure that the people that are coming over to join your team are highly reputable and that you can, you have a hundred percent trust in their ability to um, be with your kids all day. It's that speaks volumes for sure. So tell me more about how you're nurturing your team members. So what are you doing in terms of helping them with providing them feedback for personal development? Cause you and I know in the corporate world, we had a ton of that, a ton yeah. we were giving a ton of it. And we were receiving a ton of it. And the one thing that I know that I'm really good at is receiving feedback because I learned many years ago that feedback is a gift and essentially it's information. Yeah. That's all it is, is information. And and Shelly, that was, it's so funny you say that because corporate world, you're doing the 360 feedback. So my boss, the person under me left and right, they were all giving me feedback in Amex. Mm-hmm. And you were used to it. It wasn't particularly the best process. You didn't always love it going mm-hmm. into it, that your colleagues are going to be writing about you and that your bonus was dependent on it and that kind of thing. So I remember bringing it into my structure about five years ago, it feels like. And 
these were with people that really had not come from corporate world at all. And they're like, what? Mm -hmm. I'm not writing any feedback on that person. Mm -hmm. And so it was, um, we're not at 360 for sure, Mm -hmm. but we have moved along the way to being more open and honest and trying to deal with things as they crop up, which actually avoids so many problems if you don't let it build up. Mm -hmm. But we are doing one-to-one reviews. So we do one-to-one reviews annually. Although I have to say, I kind of feel like it's a bit redundant because it would be better if you had the time to do it more frequently, like every three months would make more sense. Mm -hmm. It's just a time factor. I do do quick check and balances with the leadership team. So I'll be like, okay, this is brilliant. I do a lot of this is brilliant uh, Mm -hmm. because I really think it motivates you more. And if they ever listen to this, I'm sure they will because I'm going to send it out to them. They have to know too, though, I don't give... I don't give positive feedback um, for nothing. It will, yeah. It's always got value. So I'm not, if I say you've got a nice dress, you can know for sure you've got a nice dress on. Because I, if you haven't got a nice dress on, I really won't say anything. You know, so I'm not going to be one of those fake people that just um, says something for the sake of saying it. So, and also, yeah, I have to give constructive feedback. So that's always a little bit harder, but I think you just, you know, you just have to soften it, make sure I'm not being too direct pick the right moment, uh, try not to do it on the fly in the corridor as you're walking past someone. Yeah. And I, I don't always get it right. And I know that I will then, I, I do think back over things and then I'll, I'll go back to that person and I will then say, I'm really sorry I said it this way or that way or because I think it's just good as well that I'm quite happy to put my hat up and go, that wasn't, that wasn't cool. <laughs> You know, let's, yeah, let's fix. you can earn so many more points in terms of respect as a leader when you can walk away from the conversation and come back the next day and just simply say, you know, I was thinking last night about the conversation we had yesterday and I'm not really happy with the way I, the words that I chose. And I'm thinking it may have come across a lot like with, with the wrong intention. Here's really what I was driving at. Mm. And then you just you know you can pull back from it and then go back in and then that team member you know really can stop and think wow like she didn't need to come back and reopen this conversation with me and tell me that she was feeling uncomfortable about the way she spoke to me but wow I'm glad she did because it did have a bit of a bite yeah exactly um, I think yeah. it's re- and it's really important it's it's hard to do but it's good good practice to get into mm-hmm. Yeah, and you're... even even as a leader, to not be too like high and mighty, I hope I'm not, and to sort of come back and you know, we are human. We all make mistakes on both sides. So, absolutely, that's how we know we're growing, and your team sees it. And to your point about sharing um, positive feedback just for the sake of sharing it. I think over time people understand what your style is and they know that it's genuine and that you're not just sprinkling fairy dust on people for the day. <laughs> and they understand that, wow, Antonia, she's acknowledging what I just did. She's acknowledging behavior. She's reinforcing behavior with me. She's telling me she's happy about the number of ideas that I always come up with. That's the kind of feedback that really encourages people to keep doing, right? You want to catch them doing something great so that you just keep encouraging them to outperforming that way. Absolutely. And shout about it in the team. So we have a team Facebook group and we were talking today actually about it with the leadership team. And I, and so I said to the head teacher, you now need to be the one going back to the teachers saying, great job. So she'll probably already have done that actually, but she'll be going into the Facebook team, giving a big shout out. I noticed this and I saw you do that and using our private group. Because one thing that I want to try and minimize is emails because emails just take over our lives. I don't know how many emails you get, but with emails and messaging and WhatsApp and Voxer, we're too connected. And so I want to try to, reduce down the amount of emails I send my team I don't send many actually I've really tried to you know so we use Voxer yes I like Voxer because it's um it can convey the tone much better than a text Mm -hmm. so if I was to say oh don't forget to sweep that room next time when you're finished in a text that might come across as a bit of a slap around the face but if I'm like on a Voxer going oh I just noticed that you you know it's a little bit messy would it be okay to sweep it next time and you can soften it or whatever 
yeah. then I just think the message will be better received that way. So I use Voxer for things like that. Um, what else, what other tools are you using? Did I hear you, did you say WhatsApp? WhatsApp, I, you know, I use it in different groups. So not, not work. I use it with my, I've got like um, a mastermind. I might use it with them, mm-hmm. but it's not my favorite tool. Actually, I find it difficult to keep track of all the different groups in WhatsApp. Um, we use for communication. It's just very data driven, but we use Google sheets. Yeah. Um, that's how we will map out our, who's got w- which children, you know, it's just a really good way. And what's brilliant is it stopped all the emails where we used to do it in Excel an email and then back, and then there'd be version control problems. Mm-hmm. So I had to double check that Google was secure from a GDPR point of view and all the compliance and stuff yeah. before using it. But, um, now that's how we, we use it to share docs and take backups of it because if someone accidentally makes some, a change, mm-hmm. Make sure you've downloaded some like Excel copies from Google Docs or Google Sheets. I would hate so to lose this, that. This team Facebook group that you have, are people embracing that? We use it a lot, yeah. Oh, wow. uh, if you're because you know at night you might be watching a watching something on Netflix and you might be surfing at the same time, and then we'll see something on Pinterest or in another Facebook group that could be a great idea for a holiday camp a theme or an activity or a science experiment. And what what everyone does is they just pop it in our group. Hey, you know, hey, so-and-so, this would be great for you next week. And so it's helping the teachers because lesson planning is what takes up loads of your time when you're not in front of the the teacher and the planning. Uh, So if someone else is giving you some ideas, that's saving you heaps of time. And therefore it's creating a bond between team members as well. And it's there. You can go back and find it, right? If it was something that, hey, didn't Jeremy share something? I remember it was around Easter time. You know, you just go back through and scroll. And I love the idea that the Facebook group is being embraced. I know there are teams out there that have tried to host a Facebook group for their team. And for whatever reason, it's not jiving with the team culture. But it sounds like it really is with you. And the fact that everyone's helping each other, they understand the programming that each team member is offering for the kids yeah. and therefore they, because they understand it when they see something that's complimentary or it's a fit, they're grab, taking the time to grab it, drop it in there and really, really helping out their team member. Yeah. And the other thing with the group is that because people work different times, so the yoga teacher might come in at a time when the Lego class isn't on. So they, those teachers won't necessarily see each other. Mm-hmm. But because we're sharing in that group, oh, in, in yoga today we did this, or in chess we did that, it kind of helps as well um, also selling Kiddoland outside of the team because they'll go, oh, yeah, I know we do a chess club, or which they might not have been aware of if they only come in to teach yoga and then go out. So it's helping mm-hmm. cross-sell information within the team of, of everything that we offer. You do offer some unique programming, Antonia. I went to your website And of course, I love, I just clicked the UK button. So that (laughs) everything came up in English for me. You didn't try in French. (laughs) Well, I had in Canada, of course, it's mandatory in public school to have French Uh all the way through public school. And then um, in my day, it was mandatory. You had to have two years of French in high school. So I have all the way from kindergarten to grade 10 in in French for sure and of course in my corporate life we had so many bilingual people working with us it was it was amazing but um I better understand it versus read it and so I just didn't even bother I went right to the UK button everything was transferred I went in and had a look at all the programs that you offer boy the parents in your area they just must be pinching themselves with having this type of experience and opportunities to be able to offer their kids. Thank you, Shelley. That's lovely feedback. Um, I think I really hope, no, we, we are, you know what? My kids help write so many of the ideas, so Ooh. I can't claim all of them. Lego <laughs> came from Louie, my son, years ago. I'd be walking through his bedroom, killing my feet on bits of Lego. Yes. I was like, I've got to turn it into a positive. So then we started Lego Star Wars master building classes we don't do them all the time but we do them you know maybe in one holiday of the year um daisy suddenly was into fashion and then later on into architecture and so to sort of bring my kids to work and keep them amused i'd be like well okay we'll do a week on fashion we'll do a week on architecture 
Um, we, now we do Adolan, so teenagers, we're taking them out and about on the Côte d'Azur. Mm. And, you know, we're getting paid to go and visit um, Matisse's museum and Picasso and, and all these things. And we're taking kids with us and doing it all in English. So for my creativity, it's just, and all my ideas, it's fab because it just ticks that box hugely because I can, and, and I love coming to the States and Canada because you guys are really into child activities and things. So I just can look and see what's going on there and then just bring the ideas back to France. So. Wow. I get to travel as well. It's so much fun. So much enrichment. There's there's enrichment opportunities for the kids, for the teachers, for you. It's just, it's a dream business for you, Antonia. It's worked really well alongside having kids. So both businesses that I set up, so the au pair agency and this, I really chose to do a business that could fit alongside family life. And initially I worked, you know, quite part-time hours. And now that my kids are older and they are out more and more, mm -hmm. I can add more hours on. So it's been flexible like that. And I've, of course, been able to take them to work, which is a bonus, as can my team. You know, the team will say, I haven't got anyone to mind my child. And I'll be like, no problem, bring them in. Oh, so yeah. it's kind of where it's, it, it works as a working parent. It's quite a, you know, it's quite a useful bonus to have. <laughs> To what do. a workplace to be in. That's amazing. But you you haven't slowed down just with Kadoo Land and then earlier on with your opera business, but you also have a podcast. <laughs> yeah, I do. French Riviera Firefly. Yeah. So, a little bit about the Firefly podcast. So this kind of, again, came from listening to Natalie and just really wanting to do something a bit different you know, that challenges, because once you've got into your daily grind, your daily routine, I just sometimes like to be challenged a bit more. So I was like, okay, I reckon I could do a podcast. And then we had quite a tragic event, actually, down here in the south of France on the 14th of July. There was a terrorist attack down in Nice, which is only about 30 minutes away. And the tourism went into a huge, huge decline here. Tourists just didn't want to come here. And I run a Facebook group. I've got about 9,000 members in it. And there were people sort of saying, you know, they're reliant on tourism down here. Yeah. And so I just thought I wanted to do a podcast. And I was like, well, why don't we do something that's going to put a spotlight back on the French Riviera? That was really how it, I mean, that's kind of what gave me the confidence to do it. I was like, I can help. Okay, let's do it because it's helping. And we're going to start sort of, so I'd interview entrepreneurs, people that set up their own businesses because I love hustling business. I love talking yeah. business. But also I get their life story. Why did they come to the south of France? Where do they like to hang out? Um, how did they meet friends? Because that's a huge thing when you emigrate abroad and you set up a new country is making friends, starting afresh. And so it really just kind of bubbled from that. And it was all about, you know, hashtag Cot d'Azur living, just making, you know, bringing the tourists back and making people yeah. fall back in love with, with the French Riviera. What a brilliant idea. And just once again, adding so much enrichment to your community, Antonia. It's just, it's amazing. I know you recently won an award, so I'm happy to see that people are acknowledging what you're doing for your community. Um, because that can just be so motivating, especially on the days where you think, am I doing enough? Have I made enough impact? Um, Do you know that there's a funny story about that. Carol Cox at Biz Chicks Live last year. Mm -hmm. You know, I'm sitting there, I'm writing notes, and I'm realizing that I need visibility in order to grow. Mm -hmm. But I don't really like being in the spotlight. I certainly don't like standing on a stage with a microphone. I didn't go up and speak at Biz Chicks Live on the mic because I just did not want to hear my voice on a microphone. Weird now that I have a podcast, right? <laughs> but, uh, so I come back from Biz Chick Live, and literally within four days of there, someone called me up from this... Um, from the Riviera Business Club, so it's a networking group down here, and they said they were pleased to tell me that I'd been nominated by a couple or one or several people to win this award. Mm -hmm. Would I like to be considered for the award? To do so, I have to go and present in front of a jury. <laughs> I was oh, like, my. totally torn, because I was like, on the one hand, yes, I need visibility, and yes. on the other, oh, no, I've got to go and speak in public <laughs> in front of people. And I literally called Carol up and I was like, help, <laughs> you're mm. going to have to help me because I just didn't have the confidence in myself to go and speak. But it was an amazing process because I had to, you know, put my business under the microscope. Mm -hmm. 
again, go back to my team and go, you guys are amazing. Look at everything we've done. This is so cool. And then go and present it to these people. And then they, they voted. And then you turn up on the night and you don't know who's won. So that was, again, I was like, I didn't want to have to go along to this award ceremony and not win. I was like, by that point, I definitely wanted that trophy in my hands. <laughs> <laughs> you were invested. I really was. And yeah, and so we're really lucky, um, you know, credit to the team because it is a team effort is that we won. So, and it's brought us a huge amount of visibility. And in fact, tonight, so I'm going to leave in a minute because I'm going tonight to the pre-launch um, of next year's award. Mm -hmm. and, you know, and I'm going to help them promote it because it has been brilliant for the business. It's been brilliant to look at your own business, um, but also, yeah, loads of press articles and and gives you validation in the community. So, so it's been wonderful. a great year. And all the while role modeling to your team that you can do the hard things, that you're willing to put yourself out there, be uncomfortable for the yeah. benefit of the total organization for everyone. Way to go, Antonia. <laughs> Thank you, Shelley. <laughs> so before I let you go and run off to your, your big gala planning event, is there anything that I can help you with today? So... I would be really interested to know if you've got any tech ideas on the communication with the team. So if I don't want to use email, we've got our Facebook group, but obviously that keeps it fairly light. Are there any other tips that you've got that we could be doing to improve communication with the team? Well, I'm a big proponent of choosing one or two tools and just sticking with the one or two tools. And just becoming really proficient at those two tools. So we know anytime we have a team to manage, we know we need a place for storage and we need a place for communication. Mm -hmm. And because your team, you mentioned earlier that some of your team members don't even, they're like ships that pass in the night, right? Like their, their workshop is hosted at, at other, other times. So they're not actually seeing everyone. So the fact that you've got your Facebook group set up, I think it's wonderful. You've got Boxer to give quick messages to. You're using Google Sheets. Yeah. Are you using Dropbox at all? I've got an account for Dropbox, um, and I have used it, but I don't necessarily use it daily. No, mm -hmm. but I could. So what other forms of communication does your team need? Like, tell me more about what you feel you're lacking in terms of serving your teams for communication. You're hosting team meetings, you're doing one-to-ones, you're, you're providing feedback on an ongoing basis, including formal feedback. You're doing that as well. You've got Boxer. I think that where we probably drop the ball sometimes might be when it's more in like dates or calendar type things. And I haven't gone to Google Mail or G what's it called? Google Calendar or Google Calendar for sure. I haven't done that. I'm not, I don't have, we don't use Gmail particularly. And I don't know if it's linked into that, but things like, so um, they didn't know that we're about to have a Christmas fair in December. So I thought that information had got out to everyone, but it had got out maybe in the way of um, they'd seen it on a Facebook thing, but not officially. Mm -hmm. So maybe so that is you need a, a shared team calendar. calendar. A, a an overall team calendar where your team can go and just check to see what's, what's on the docket for the week, what's on the docket for the month, what's coming up next month. You could even track everyone's vacation on there. Yeah. All the programs would be there, local community events that you want to have a presence at, or at least know that the kids are yeah. talking about and the parents would be talking about. But you could use a plain, simple Google Calendar to be able to create that, where everyone can come in, have access to it, and be able to even drop in information. Although I wouldn't recommend everyone have access to make changes to the calendar. I think there should be a primary owner and an, and an admin backup to the calendar because okay. everyone had access to be able to go in and add information or move information around. Then there's just risk there that something could be forgotten or, Hey, I thought you were going to change that. No, I thought you said you were going to change that. You know, like you don't want to get into those kind of ideas, but definitely having one single calendar for your team to have access to and, to be their, their map, really, right? The calendar becomes the roadmap 
for each quarter. And then you have your own separate calendar with your own appointments and, and mm -hmm. your own personal things on. And I would even include on that calendar your one-to-one -one schedules. Your, okay, and, yeah, yeah, yeah. I would include all that on there because what when you have a shared calendar like that, what you're really creating is transparency amongst your organization. There's no secrets. There's no, um, like I know in the corporate world, we used to have this saying that said, it's on a need to know basis. <laughs> Remember that? Yeah. Um, but in an organization like this, the more you can be transparent, the less secrets there are. Everyone really feels like they're a part of this bigger organization. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And then they can go and ask, hey, I, I noticed in March, Jennifer's on vacation for three days. What's the backup plan for her uh, to take over her workshops for that week? Shelley, it's a great idea because... You know, things like as well, people are doing my role. And so I am, it's my mindset problem, really. But I'm thinking they think I don't work anymore. Well, I am, but I'm working on other things. So I might be going to a networking or I'm going to work tonight. That will also be networking, yeah. um, meeting with journalists. But they don't necessarily see that. They just see that I'm not there. Mm -hmm. So I suppose I can put things in so that they sort of see what's going on in the background and might be going, okay, well, what happened after that meeting? And it might generate conversations. Yeah, it's a great idea. And then everyone really starts to respect those CEO tasks that you're doing. And they'll get excited about seeing proof that you're out there developing the business further. Yeah. That they're making really strategic connections within the community. And it just it elevates their sense that they're under your care and guidance, right? Like they're, the children are coming and they're under the care and guidance of your team. And your team is under the care and guidance of you. So as they start to see all the things in the background that you're working on, it really gives them a sense of purpose and a sense of calmness that, yeah, I'm going to be here long term. Like I am invested in QD land. Brilliant. Shelley, you know, I'll be setting that up tomorrow. <laughs> <laughs> I love to take action, girl. <laughs> Well, thank you so much for coming and joining me today. I can't wait to see you again in November. Shelley, it's been an absolute pleasure. And me too. I cannot wait to get to the other side and leave my team to run things here, knowing oh. that with the time difference, it's, it's a win-win for everyone. What a beautiful <laughs> thing, Antonio, that you can step out from your business, go overseas, join yeah. a conference, totally unplug from your business, and know that if there's any hiccup or any fire to put out, you're not even really going to be aware of it because yeah. you've got this confident team around you that's so committed to you and the brand and the kids that it, ju it just offers up a really exciting opportunity for them to manage the business when you're away. Yeah, safe hands. That's brilliant. Well, I look forward to seeing you, Shelley. <laughs> All right. Take care, lady. Thank you so much. Bye. Bye. So here's the thing. There was just so many things that Antonia is doing right. Didn't you just love how she talked about the importance of her team being number one and her clients being number two? She knows that a happy and valued team will serve her kids with exactly the right attitude and energy that will ensure the kids want to come back. And her process for selecting who to hire next by using her team to help decide who's a great fit, along with the background checks and the onboarding process, have really lended so well for her to have a rock star team whose reputation is far and wide. I found it intriguing when she explained her method on how to promote from within to build her leadership team. And of course, feedback. You can tell it's very important to her. She knows the value of it from her corporate experience at Amex, and she's taking care to put that learning into play in her own business. I'm just so proud of her. As a business owner, Antonia's role certainly has shifted. She now is inspecting her high standards, keeping a watchful eye on costs, and coaching by hosting touchpoint meetings with her team. She's scaling her business, and she's so set to multiply. Are you? Was there any particular aspect of what Antonio is doing
that you want to reapply? Have you ever considered launching your own Team Voxer or Team Facebook group? Or how about a team calendar? Maybe you've thought about having your team members participate in your hiring process. Running these suggestions by your team to get input on what areas of the operations they'd like to see improved upon will spur some of their ideas too. And naturally, they'll be more inclined to truly give it a go. And be sure to check out Antonia's podcast, The Riviera Firefly. It's a podcast designed for people who are living or would like to visit the French Riviera. Hmm, that sounds so lovely. So be sure to check out all the show notes where we'll have all the links teed up for you on how you connect with Antonia and her team. And hey, are you in the hiring mode? We'd love to help you. The team has bundled our best PDFs that we've created about hiring so that you can get stacking your team. Plus, you'll also get an easy access list of podcast episodes related to hiring. Just pop over to the website at www.bizchicks.com slash hiring. That's B-I-Z-C-H-I-X dot com slash hiring to get your free bundle of hiring resources. I'll see you next week when we meet another brilliant business owner. And remember, if you've got a dream, you need a team. See you in the coop. Thank you for joining us for this episode of Stacking Your Team. Please click subscribe in your podcast app so you never miss an episode. And head on over to bizchicks.com slash join to get access to the private Facebook group we host for women entrepreneurs. The group is free to join. And when you do, you get access to the complimentary downloads associated with both of our podcasts. We include the links in our weekly newsletter. No matter where you have come from or where you are going, you are the leader your company needs and you are worthy of being CEO. Stay focused, biz chicks, and go stack your team. Oh,